um, you might know me from these groups, Polish Database Group, uh, Geekon Conference, or Software Craftsmanship Kraków. Actually, the uh, latter is most awesome for this talk because it gave me like at least three papers to use uh, in preparation. I'm also leading Lambda, so uh, if you are interested in functional programming but you believe you don't have the venue for actually talking about it, just contact me and uh, we'll organize things out. Uh, the other person to contact is Grzesiek, who is sitting o over here. Can you stand up? It's, uh, I waited for this opportunity to actually announce uh, Grzesiek being uh, adopted as the organizer for Lambda Launch Kraków. Bravo! <laughs> and I'm glad he came because I wasn't sure he will. So, uh, if you ever heard some quotes like these ones, uh, or read about them, and you were slightly annoyed, uh, annoyed by the fact and that, well, it's actually more hype than data, then you're at the right place, because what I want to talk is exactly that. So, if you read Mythical Man Month by Frederick Brooks, you probably know the concept of silver bullet. If you do not, let me actually introduce it real quick. So, uh, medieval mythology and a number of other mythologies as well contains a monster known as a werewolf. It's a really hairy, scary monster which can gruesomely kill you in a matter of seconds. So, to kill a werewolf, one would employ silver. And, well, just silver bullets is born. And a number of people uh, make various claims, like, for example, that this or that is actually a silver bullet for the programming. So, uh, if you want to be a good programmer, you need to do this and that because it's a silver bullet and it solves all your problems. And um, as far back as in the 70s from the previous uh, century, Frederick Brooks, Brooks took actually that concept and uh, he took it apart, claiming that there was no silver bullet and we actually as a programmers, we only have lead bullets. So we have a number of tools at our disposal to be good at what we do. <coughs> But uh, there is no one tool or methodology or whatever, programming para paradigm included, that will be actually s a silver bullet and thus much more effective. So about myself and the talk, and this is pretty much covered, uh, what actually means better in terms of programming languages? And uh, the usual claims we hear when uh, someone talks about functional programming being totally awesome and what data I found on them during my studies. Also, not so usual claims like, for example, good uh, object-oriented programming is uh, close enough or actually enough to be on par with functional programming. And in the end, I'll try to summarize, so why bother with functional programming answering the title question. Show of hands, lovely people, who here has read the following papers? Why Functional Programming Matters by John Hughes, a number of hands, not as many as I would have hoped. Uh, you might want to actually uh, make it up because John Hughes, I believe, is present during the conference. So he will be nevertheless very, ple ple very pleased if you do that. Out of the tar pit, similar number of hands, also similar people who raise their hands, so uh, let me watch them slightly more close. And can programming be liberated from von Neumann style? Ah, this one was surprisingly different to this, but there is one person who read all those free papers. Uh, thank you, dear sir. I count on you to actually spot any mistakes I'll be making during the talk. Uh, out of the papers, these, these three are actually uh, one there, uh, which offered me the most substance for the most substance for actually most of the claims I'm making here. Uh, I have also to apologize to you because this is yet work in progress. I'll be making all the list of uh, sources and uh, uh, studies I came across available on my blog. Uh, please feel free to contribute. I'll be also making a paper out of this, so uh, the paper will be most likely uh, available on GitHub. So this is yet work in progress as I stumbled this week upon some very interesting leads and was unable to actually incorporate them here. So if you would like to hear the next improved version of the presentation, uh, stay tuned. I'll be speaking about it on uh, Studencki Festival Informatyczny, which is the Student Festi uh, Festival of Informatics, and on the lab in the, at the LambdaCon uh, in Italy. So when somebody says functional programming is better, then uh, usually he talks about either a paradigm or some specific language. And usually he has a number of arguments which pretty often boil down to personal experience, but more about, later, more about that later. Pretty much functional programming uh, implementation is functional language. 
Functional languages that we know are, well, there is a number of them, some quite popular, some less popular. Still, it's one important thing to be noted. Pretty much every language is a tool. Pretty much every tool that we programmers create is designed with something in mind. We came up on a problem, we needed a tool to solve the problem, we created a tool to solve the problem. So, uh, usually when you take a look at programming language, it's also designed with something in mind. Somebody wanted something out of this language, somebody wanted to express ideas differently, to implement uh, lambda calculus by Alonzo Church, and to do something with it that he wasn't able to do in any other language he wrote in previously. So take, uh, take a look at the language that you're using, or that this other person is claiming to be really awesome, and ask yourself the, this question. What is the design goal of this language? What was it designed with in mind? A uh, number of people, when Java uh, started to be the new big thing, uh, said that Java is better than C or C++ because you don't have to deal with memory allocation. There is a number of arguments behind these claims, but uh, to be honest, is a language really good if you actually take away a feature? If you can't say add a subtract to addition, is this language really make you a better program? Does this language really make you a better programmer? That's the question that I would like you to actually ponder for a moment. Uh, because, yeah, Java was safer through the fact that you gave, it gave you tools for automatic memory management, say garbage collector and all that, uh, coupled with actually preventing you from shooting yourself in the foot with uh, by hand memory allocation. So this actually led to somewhat uh, some popularity in Java, but that was safer. In some contexts, it doesn't mean better. The usual claims. It is the future. Functional programming is the next big thing coming. It will change the world and all that. That's claim number one. Functional programming as a new paradigm changes the way you think about code, changes the way you program, changes you, in, makes you into a better programmer. Also, it gives you another tool to have at your disposal. You may reach into your toolbox and reach out and solve the problem with functional programming. It leads to shorter or tesser code. Your code will have less opportunities for bugs. It gives you more power. It gives you better abstractions. This leads to higher code reuse. This leads to actually making writing program, be, programs becomes more convenient. Less complexity to deal with. No state mutation. Some say even no state. It makes you think in streams and this actually gives you better way of programming, composing programs, it gives you uh, less side effects. It gives you actually opportunity to write code without side effects. It's reliable, it's proven, it can be proven. Programs written in functional pro programming style can be actually reasoned about. It solves the multi-core problem because it's better for concurrency. I suppose these claims are familiar to you, aren't they? I see a little nodding, so, uh, which is not familiar? A total silence. <laughs> I thought so. So, let's start with the future. What is the future thing, the next big thing? How can you actually take a look and say, measure it? So, you can take a look at fame, trends. Uh, how much do we talk about it during the conferences? How many articles? Can we see about it? How many articles, tutorials, and whatnot appears in mainstream sources? Practicality, market share, in which domains this is used. This technology is how, how exactly it's widespread. Uh, the languages that support this technology, how widely popular are they? So, by fame. Yeah, we are here at Lambda Days conference strictly oriented to uh, Lambda-related things, which is functional programming. Uh, there is LambdaCon, there is a number of other conferences which are fairly young. 
This is second edition of Lambda Days. I believe Lambda Count has like three editions. During Strange Loop, if you take a look at their agenda year by year, you can see that functional programming topics are quite prevalent and they actually moved from, oh, sorry. Are you familiar with the Emerging Languages Camp? I hear a few yeses, but not so many. Uh, Strange Loop actually has a side event, sort of like Lambda Days has React Day. Strange Loop the, has the new Emerging Languages Camp. And if you are a creator of a language, you actually can talk about your language there. And it gives you an almost opportunity for in-depth talk about language design and all that. So if you take a look at it, you will notice year by year that uh, y languages that are functional are quite prominent in appearance. It was quite the same when you actually uh, took a look at how many people wanted to talk about their own Java implementation back in the 90s, when Java actually came to, came to prominence. So looking at the conferences, looking at the articles, which even appear in the most mainstream uh, sources for uh, Java and .NET uh, coders, yeah, it's on the rise. Uh, it's quite prominent. You can actually take a look at it and think, yeah, this might be the next big thing. Practicality. Market share, who and where uses domains. And here we have a much bigger problem. First of all, if you try to answer even a simpler question, like for example, who uses, say, um, Zinc? Azul, uh, Azul Systems, the uh, implementation of the virtual Java machine. And if you take a look at just that, you'll notice that a number of people who even might use Zinc or are even known to use Zinc, they are not really very vocal about it. There is a number of reasons. You don't want actually to uh, reveal to whole world the technology stack of your favorite application, which brings you money. There is also the startup advantage. If I believe that this and that technology offers me competitive advantage to others, I will not talk about it out loud. At least not until I capitalize on that competitive advantage now, that's a given. So, if we take a look at the market share, uh, we have not much data to go on. So it's hard to see uh, how actually functional programming is taking the market. By storm? By tiptoes? Not much to go on. Uh, there are job offers though. And job offers are actually the best intel we have. And the other intel we have is the adoption level. You can clearly judge the popularity of a given paradigm by how features of given paradigm appear, are appearing in mainstream languages. One of the mainstream languages is Java, the other would be C, uh, yet another would be Python, and all of those actually have functional paradigm incorporated in that way or another. Yet another reason for believing that functional paradigm is gaining momentum is the fact that pretty much a number of new languages appeared that are quite functional. Closure on the JVM and uh, hybrid or multi paradigm or whatever you call it, Scala. Haskell also is gaining traction, so by that virtue, we can see that the adoption is raising. Now, of course, uh, we don't have actual data unless we take a look at something that has been here quite long. And number one, and probably less obvious choice, is SQL. SQL adopted a number of functional programming paradigm features, like, for example, immutability, uh, quite some time ago, to cope with uh, large volumes of data. So if we take a look at the adoption level, yes, there is a rise in recent years, say, like 2002 and more. If we take a look at the language popularity within job trends, uh, there is this site, Indeed, uh, which offers you to actually uh, gauge what is trendy and offers you actually to glimpse what you should be learning. So I've taken a number of functional languages, that is Scala, Erlang, Haskell, Fhash, uh, Lisp. And while Scala is the most prominent here, and the rest of them, well, not so much, uh, let's take a look at the scale. 0 0.04. Impressive, wouldn't you say? Now, let's make something even worse. Let's put it in context. Let's add the big players. 
So we have SQL, we have Java, uh, then we have C++, wow, it's on, in decline, and yeah, JavaScript, sorry, this is JavaScript, this is C++. The colors on this might actually elude you slightly, but this here, <laughs> yeah, these are all the others. So, um, again, not so great. Question. Go on. It's all juxtapositions or just programming juxtapositions or right. juxtapositions? Because it's strange to me that Java has only 4% of juxtapositions on the team. It should be like 20 or something. Uh, this is all juxtapositions. And this is actually through all domains because I wanted to have also data that incorporate not only software jobs. Okay. A number of jobs actually are presented as not jobs in software industry, but jobs, say, in finance industry or something else, when you actually create software to solve business problems. Okay, so 0 0.4 and 4 is not so far away. That's <laughs> <laughs> you see? You see what he's doing here? Ah, let me guess. You, you're uh, one of the functional programmers, aren't you? <laughs> now, for the fact I know that he is, so this is not, not really honest from, from my side, but uh, yeah, that's as you said. The mainstream ones are declining. Uh, sorry? They're all declining. Okay. Yes, they are. Here. Yes, they are. But the, what's our next job should be? I think, it's, I think the number of the jobs in IT is pretty much the same, but the number of the jobs in 1914 is much higher than in the crisis. That is also correct. I'll talk, ab talk about such reasoning more in the next graphs to come, where I'll have more data actually to back up my claims. Because, uh, as Krzysztof noted, there is a number of reasons which can explain the drops or highs in these graphs, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to them. So, since I promise you I will not offer you speculations but real data, I will not delve into this. So, uh, the graphs is as it is. Uh, on Indeed.com you may find the actual uh, data managing algorithm as much as they reveal. They don't reveal that much, to be honest. But, if we take a look at, uh, yeah, this is when I wanted to see also Ruby on the screen. Not faring well, sorry Ruby. Then another source would be GitHub. The quite popular and social coding site, which aims to be uh, the gathering for pretty much every, every programmer, and which tries to actually show you a number of things about the data. GitHub offers data mining API, which a number of sites and projects uses to actually take a look at number of things. And if we take a look at this Redmonk made graph, Redmonk's made uh, a nice uh, post on the site which explains pretty much everything about the graph. How it was taken, uh, what stands behind which uh, peak and actually decline, and all that. And for that matter, uh, if you take a look at Perl, you will see that we have a peak here. And the reason for that is actually a Gitpan project. Do you know Gitpan project? I know that at least one person does, uh, as, a, as expected, or a Perl hacker. So Gitpan project is actually uh, a project by Redmonks and uh, Cpan to port Cpan repositories to GitHub. Well, for those of you who do not know Cpan, it's actually the largest code repository for Perl's for Perl monks and Perl hackers. So they brought a number of repositories to GitHub and that was uh, the reason behind the peak. Uh, why Ruby declined so much? You might think that Ruby used to be widely popular, but in fact it, it's quite different thing happened here. GitHub became popular. As GitHub became popular, contributions by just Rails people and Ruby people were not enough to keep up with contributions from other languages in general. So. Ruby never was the most popular language ever. Oh, sorry, okay, that's speculation. Uh, you, don't, you shouldn't actually uh, take from this graph that Ruby was the most popular uh, language back in 2008, 2009. Uh, it's actually that when on GitHub it was the most popular. So unfortunately, uh, even when I'm trying to present you data, you, you see that you really need to take it with a grain of salt. And well, in this case, perhaps not even a grain, perhaps like, a bucket. 
quick question. Do you know how GitHub determines that it's a Java project or Python project? What's the algorithm? Uh, some projects awesome question. Thank you for it. Uh, so, um, Nilian asks uh, how actually GitHub says that, well, this code is Java or Python or whatever. Uh, unfortunately, most, uh, the most highest criteria, most scored is lines of code. So this actually leads to that. <laughs> That's not a good metric. So, <laughs> so unfortunately, if you take a look at this, you can see that JavaScript is the next big thing. <laughs> we really should stop going to Lambda base, leave this room, go learn some JavaScript. And uh, the reason for this popularity is unfortunately the fact that if you create any web application, you're most likely pulling JavaScript frameworks. What you code is like few lines of HTML, perhaps some CSS, and then you add jQuery. <laughs> Ta-da! You've created a new JavaScript repository. Congrats. So, if you want to actually really play with these things, I recommend you GitHub info. It's a totally awesome page. I don't know if I have, I have uh, web access here to show you. I might not. Sorry. Uh, good music, though, if you're into it. So GitHub actually is uh, the force behind this. And on the side, they have a number of other uh, categories, like total number of forks, uh, total number of uh, new repositories, uh, number of issues per language, and when a language came out. So you can actually take a look and see Objective-C, how it fares across all the categories. and. Honestly, I recommend you spend five to ten minutes playing with it. Uh, it will be time well spent. Tiobi. Tiobi is yet another tool to actually measure the popularity of a given language. Uh, it's widely quoted as the best source for such statistics and intel. Uh, what it contains on the very first page, so to say. Uh, what grew most in r recent year? Uh, long range trends, very long range trends, think like 1985. For me, that's quite some time. And it contains yearly index of languages, like what first the best. I look at top 50, and across 2014 2015, top 10 contains no pure functional language. You might, of course, reply back to me that, well, that is like Haskell and a few others, right? And I say, yeah, sure, so name me a functional language and I'll try to name you back its position. Scala. Scala. 46. Closure. Closure. Uh, around 30. 30. Yes. F sharp. No. F -sharp. No way. Ah, that's sharp from you. That's actually the best and most popular functional language as it stands by Tiobi. It's actually number 14. So you don't have actually anything higher than that. And takes a look at two first rows here. 16% in ratings and 15% in ratings go to C and Java. Let's look at the ratings. As we've seen with previous graphs, graphs are dangerous, so let's look at the logic behind them. So, Tiobi works actually by calculating hits for a very specific search query. The query is language programming. Quoted and with a plus. So basically we're looking for basic programming, Java programming, <coughs> closure programming, and all that. And they are doing this using 25 search engines, which they pull out from Alexa, which is a page ranker, basically. And counted hits are normalized. Uh, basically, they take a look at search engine for all languages, and all languages together add up to 100%. So from all queries, queries for Java, queries for C, 
make up for more than 30% of all queries in programming. Forget JavaScript. Go, le go learn C. Go work in Java. Maybe because they're harder, that's why. <laughs> I like that. I like that. You guys keep coming back with those. I'll later make it into some further studies. So, are they really harder to teach? Uh, it seems like legit lead, to be honest. Why? Because usually what they what they actually are searching for is our offers for uh, offers for trainings, for example, our offers for uh, improving the skills, tutorials, and all that. So basically, resources <laughs> aimed at gearing you towards being more productive in a given language. Not all that, but still. And uh, they have uh, in a in a minute. They have a uh, hand-calculated confidence factor for each search. So for example, if you, they are looking for basic programming, they take first 100 results and see whether it's really basic or for example, improve your basic Java programming skills. Uh, one thing I want to say, this is, it counts the amount of times someone made a query or the amount, number of documents that returned with that query? Uh, number of hits for that query. Number of documents that returned. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, but I could argue it's like you were on a classical music conference and arguing that Lady Gaga is number one hit constantly. I mean, so what? Yeah. Things that are the most popular are rarely the best. I would even argue that they are never the best, right? So Actually, what music is the most popular music. Uh, who's Wagen is the most popular car, and so on and so on. There are two true? angles to your question and perhaps even a third which I didn't get. So let me uh, repeat. The question is basically, so what if the language is popular? Now, my answer in this talk is, uh, I searched for any indicator that would actually tell me that functional programming paradigm is the next big thing. It's the thing of the future, uh, the thing that will change the world and all that. Popularity of functional languages uh, is, an indi in, is an indicator. It ain't indicator that it's the best thing. That's not the same. But it's an indicator that more and more people uh, want to learn those languages because they see any need in it. Be it even fashion. They want to be fashionable, and fashionable people, fashionable programmers, uh, learn functional languages. OK. So FP languages at TOB, and none makes it past currently uh, FHash, which is at number 14. Uh, they hold usually less than 1% rating, with the sole exception being FHash. Uh, yet another thing, uh, usually they hold a rating at like 0.4%, stuff like that. So, not much. A uh, number of nice functional languages, like for example Erlang, didn't make it into top 15. Sorry, not 15, 50. The index as it stands right now for the top 10 languages is at, as you can see. And notice one thing, the really sharp difference between the leaders and the rest of the world. Uh, to be honest, if you were to ask me what I attribute this to, then I would say tooling and usages. C is the system language and most of the systems servers operate on is in some form of C. And Java is the mainstream language, which uh, pretty much took to every domain since like 15 or more years. Well, now even 20 years. So if you were to ask for my opinion why those languages are so prominent, that would be it. Summarizing fame. Is it on the rise? Yes, definitely. Is it dominating? Is it a must have? Is it something that you should actually start learning right on, right on the go? Mm, well, not yet. I would like to actually say something else because I like functional programming, but I don't have any data to back it up. So this, of course, includes the, start, the startup advantage that is I'm holding, uh, I'm holding back the information that I'm using functional languages because they give me competitive advantage. Uh, this includes lack of data on the market, actually what companies use what technologies. Uh, and one last thing I should tell you. 
Language gets famous, popular if it's pushed forward. It needs to have backers. So for example, Scala has backers in forms of TypeSafe, and Java had backers in forms of Sun and later Oracle. So if your backer is strong one, then the language will survive. And that is one of the uh, greatest, uh, if you actually were to look for <coughs> F -hash -host, reasons for F -hash -host to prominence, I would say Microsoft backing would be uh, among the reasons. Sorry? I would say, yeah, operating systems. So these are not company oriented backers, these are rather um, backers, and actually factual backers. The fact is that if you want to write system code, you have C at your disposal and perhaps Go. And that's about it. Google is backing Go and the, pr the point is where they want to take it. This might lead to further prominence of Go. Go, in TOB index, was one of the languages which won uh, the um, most prominent language of the year award, which, for example, happened to none of the functional programming languages I know since like 2002, because that's as far as I, w as I, w as I went. Foot bending and yet another tool to have you in your toolbox. Let's face it, general truth says that you should learn things different from your own field. And people stated throughout the ages, be it on the sword side, sword side like Miyamoto Musashi, uh, be it on the uh, craftsman side, like for example famous cathedral builders, or be it on the software side, like a number of people, uh, Paul Graham, Eric Raymond, uh, Martin Fowler, and a long list of names follows. So, truth is, and there are studies that actually show it, we think in patterns. If we think in patterns, then if you learn something new, uh, then you can take the patterns from what you learned and apply it to computer science. So, yeah. Number of personal statements floats around on the internet, and you can see, for example, I learned Haskell and I became better programmer. You can see also, I learned Haskell and I suffer. Why do you think this guy suffers? <laughs> there are. Uh, a friend of mine runs Flowbox. I think they are hiring. They write in Haskell. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there is a little job of Haskell at the market, so you're right. So much. Uh, that's one of the reasons. But the other reason is uh, he started applying functional programming concepts into his usual C hash job. That led to a person from his team asking him, okay, I kind of see what you did there. Those three functions, etc. why not just a for loop? And the problem was there, but his code was actually not so readable anymore for his colleagues. So he was forced to actually go back to imperative programming, which actually uh, went against his principles now. So yeah, uh, definitely by number of personal accounts, uh, much more accounts you can find on the web and among m your circles, most likely, uh, that say that, yeah, learning functional programming made one a better programmer or give, gave him a deep insight into something or simply different insight into programming. Uh, one of the most actually interesting leads I found was there are universities, both in Europe and in the uh, United States and in Canada, that actually uh, are running a very interesting experiment. Instead of exposing uh, young 2B programmers to imperative languages, they expose them to functional languages and to imperative languages to see how will they fare later. And uh, I don't have yet the full, the full actually data on the experiment and how it goes, etc. but initial findings seem to suggest that, uh, yeah, people who are exposed to functional programming languages first, uh, later stay with them. Which is interesting uh, in terms of yet another criteria. So I'll come back to that later. Shorter and tesser code. Pretty much every damn tutorial on every damn functional programming language has this example that if you write in my language, this will lead to you writing shorter code. 
And there is the example uh, which shows that if you do it imperative style, you have two for loops and whatnot. And in the functional style, you have only two functions in one line and whatnot. Cool. Really. I get it. That's something that personally frustrates me, as you can see. But usually, uh, pretty much always, those tutorials have this statement. Usually, it leads to shorter code. Most of the times, this leads to shorter code. It can lead to shorter code. Cool, lovely, but not data. They don't have studies, they don't do studies, because to do studies on something like that, it's actually quite time consuming and hard. So, no studies that I found prove that functional programming actually leads to shorter code in general, or even in specific cases. I found no data. I think Erickson did a study with Erlang about this. Yes, but on the Erlang uh, frequently asked questions page, uh, there are some statements, but there ain't data that back up these statements. So they actually published the end result of their studies without me being able to replicate it. Perhaps I said wrongly. I don't think that, <coughs> that typing is the biggest problem in computer science, so the length of the code shouldn't really, uh, shouldn't really mean that much. Excellent point. I like your writing. What's your name? Yeah. Rafał. Awesome. Rafał said something very, very clever. Uh, shorter code ain't the biggest problem we have in computer science. Typing longer or shorter, well, it's convenient for us, but it doesn't actually think, it doesn't actually yeah, lead straight. And that's another awesome point. Whenever you write shorter code, you are uh, close to sacrificing re readability. No, it's not like this. It's not like this. The shorter code does not mean that I use shorter names for my, for my attributes. For some people it does, but I get what you mean. This is rather about the you know, expression that I would like to source something. It does not mean that I have to write everybody, everywhere in my code this sorting algorithm because I don't know how to you know, pass this function or whatever else. Yeah. Awesome observation. Uh, what Wieszek said is something I'll be talking about on the next slide. So basically, when people are talking to you that functional programming is better because it leads to terser code or shorter code, there are two ways they mean it. One way is I type less, I have less opportunities to actually uh, introduce bugs because I typed less letters, signs, characters, whatever. So yeah, useless. And the other is more power. <coughs> Thank you. Five, ten minutes left, people. <coughs> this means we're going straight to the end. So more power. More power as in better abstractions, as in <coughs> ability to express myself better, more concisely, uh, more to my liking. Possibility for me to think about what I want to achieve with the code instead of just fiddling around with the code to actually achieve anything. Have you heard about the blood paradox? Hands up. Ah, awesome, four people. There's actually six people. That's like my personal record. So, the blood para paradox basically goes like that. First, languages vary in power. Second, uh, take a look at the assembly in the any high level language, yeah? Who uses assembly now to code when he can use actually high level language? There are either superb arguments in favor of assembly, or you go with high, higher level language. So programmer, programming languages do vary in power. So we can actually have an axis and place them uh, ascendingly. So let's have a hypothetical language blob, which we'll place right in the middle of the power axis. And then let's have a hypothetical blob programmer. And the observation that Graham made about it is as follows. If blob programmer takes a look at the languages down, or rather to the left, my left, your right, probably. Uh, previous on the axis, previous is such a wonderful term, so previously located on the axis, then he will see, nah, they're weak. They don't have this or that feature which I so love about blob. But if same programmer was to look up on what's next on the axis, then he actually sees some weird languages 
And the most favorite quote that Graham tosses when he tells the story is, for example, those with lots of parentheses. <laughs> so more powerful is weird, less powerful is obvious and weak. And that is, this ties closely with comfort zone and what you know. And this ties with one practical thing. Don't argue that with everybody. Either you make them experience the language that you claim to be stronger, or just don't argue this. Because you're not getting anywhere. You don't have data to prove that language is more powerful. How do you actually would want to prove that this language or that language has better abstractions? Next claim, less bugs. So Frederick Brooks, along with uh, tearing apart the silver bullet concept, also talked about complexity. And complexity would be the essential one. I need to solve the problem. Problem has this and that complexity. I need to tackle this complexity. This is essential. I don't, then I don't solve the problem. Accidental. To solve my problem, I'll pull library X or tool Y. Tool Y comes along with this and that complexity when I want to use it for, say, manipulating images. Now, in order to actually solve my problem, I need to tackle essential complexity of manipulating images plus the complexity of the tool I'm using for the job. So far, so clear? Okay. So, there is a number of papers which shows and ties complexity with state. And there are quite nice logical reasonings and you can freely use that to dispute both the merits and the disadvantages of functional programming to your heart's content. There are no studies which would be large enough to actually be of any usage, of any use, but there is a number of really nice papers, including all three that I've started the talk with, and a number of others, which can back this claim up. State mutation versus immutability, referential transparency, which means less side effects, or no side effects, actually. So we have papers on all that. We don't have studies that would back it up. Next, you can reason about it. You can use algebra of programs. After all, functional programming underneath boils down to math. If it boils down to math, you can, for example, prove that your program will work as, it, as intended. You don't have to have suits of tests, you may use reasoning, formal or informal. But you won't. Sorry, that's my claim judging from how many people adopted tools for it, how many tools there are for actually proving that your program works in any given language. There aren't that many. The best actually we make use of it is in type inference. Take a look at Scala, take a look at Haskell even. Even better type inference. And yeah, we do use it when we construct the programs, but we don't use it much to reason about uh, programs, say, in a way to prove them. If you have data that contradicts it, I'm glad to learn it, but I found none. No, there are a group of tools called property testing, which actually uses this effect. Yes. So Scala, check, quick check, those tools are Coq, very, very for popular. example, yeah. COQ. Yes. So tools are there, but they aren't so prominently used. So if I said that there are no tools, yes, there are tools, but prominent usage, etc., not so much. And frankly, if we deal with a business that's really mission critical, say a plane falls down or a space shuttle did, doesn't get anywhere, or uh, if my software doesn't work right, people lose lives. There are usually other means in place to make sure that the software is reliable, not just functional programming, and not necessarily proving that uh, said program does what it what it should do, should do. And so, uh, I, didn't, I didn't get the argument. You're saying that there are programs in which we don't care about correctness. I mean, if I don't get my paycheck end of the week, I'll be frustrated. I think that program should be correct. <laughs> It doesn't have to be flights for medical devices. It may be making an incorrect mistake, a lot of money. What I tried yeah, to I mean, actually... For the correctness. Yeah, I know, but it's sometimes easier to deploy something and then make the, make the mistakes you've made, fix them up, right? <coughs> then I don't work for one year and, okay, so we work one year and here you got the problem. But I need it a half year ago, right? 
so sometimes incorrectness is acceptable sometimes, right? If you want to run the business, right? Yeah. The discussion here goes around whether we actually uh, want correct programs or not. Uh, usually we do. Your example with the paycheck at the end of the month. Uh, sometimes we don't need to, the counterpoint. Uh, usually you won't do it. Why such claim? Uh, because we have software crisis since like 1960. And the software crisis doesn't go away. And the reason for that is quite numerous and should be topic of yet another debate. So for the sake of backing this with data, let's say for now this is just my claim. Because that will be more honest. This is just my claim. I do have some data to back it up, but let's take it outside. Outside with boxing gloves. <laughs> I like it. I like it. With boxing gloves, I stand a chance. So, functional programming solves multi core problem because it's immutable, because you do not share state, because you often don't have state, because you have referential transparency, because you think in streams and function calls function calls function. So, it's pretty much linear ex execution and you can make it independent. Yeah, there are papers which nicely outline all that. There are no studies that would show us what actually works. Uh, I would really like to talk to Erlang people about this because I believe they have the data. They should have the data. Erlang is in the concurrency business for quite many years now. So uh, they state that it works. You can take their word or do not believe it. Unusual claims. Hybrid approaches are the next big things. And good OOP works similarly to FP. Good OOP as in small talk, uh, the way it was intended, the way it was designed, etc. So again, these are more leads that I would like to follow on here than something I have big data enough to actually be ready to engage in a scientific discussion. So for now, uh, let's say I'll include more data on this in the next versions of the presentations. So summarizing. You can infer a number of things about concurrency. You have some data about concurrency if you talk to Erlang people. Uh, you have complexity. Uh, you can reason about programs, but not many people do it for you to actually pull out the data and use it in an argument whether functional languages are better or not. Uh, you can argue, though, uh, about power and expressiveness in functional languages, but please do make people experience them first. And Tesla code doesn't really make a difference, so does popularity. My point about it, and that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for listening and for the discussion. Uh, thank you for nice points I got.